Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the industry update session. Uh, my name is Bruce Patsy. I'm with Oil Dry Corporation of America. And uh, I'm here today to uh, introduce some, some very good speakers. Uh, the industry updates highlights the latest innovations in products and services of direct relevance to oils, fats, proteins, surfactants, foods, and sustainable material research, development, and production. Um, Leading researchers and, and product experts today from Oil Dry, um, Ancom Technologies, uh, Amano Enzyme, and then Deschmet Balestra will all be talking today. Uh, at the end of each of our speeches, there'll be a 30 minute question and answer segment. So stick around for that and please uh, forward in questions. We'll need them to have a good uh, discussion with the panel. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, start off uh, the first presentation, which is actually Oil Dry Corporation. Uh, and myself, Bruce Patsy, again, I'm general manager for Oil Dry and our fluids purification group. And uh, I'll be uh, talking with Brooks, who's our research chemist, uh, head research chemist at our Vernon Hills, Illinois facility. And uh, Dave has uh, background. Uh, he started off his career with the USDA in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, he came to us about 30 years ago, or a little more than 30 years ago, and he's uh, got a wealth of information in the fats and oils industry. And, uh, you know, it's been great to work with Dave these years. Uh, we'll be talking and outlining the benefits of oil dry, what we provide to, their, to our customers and prospective customers, and uh, a discussion on topics, uh, some helpful hint for refiners uh, to enhance uh, and to reduce the use of bleaching clay. And then also I'll be introducing uh, our newest product, Metal X, which is used for the renewable diesel market and some other new concepts that we're starting to work on in our lab. And with that, uh, we'll kick off a, a short uh, 10 minute video and then there'll be a 10 minute question and answer. So please forward in your questions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bruce Patsy and I work with Oil Dry Corporation of America. I am a uh, Vice President and General Manager of our Fluids Division. Uh, today, we're here to answer a few questions. Um, our company produces bleaching clay products, which are used in the fats and oils industry. Uh, to my left is David Brooks, and David is the Senior Scientist at our Innovation Center in Vernon Hills, Illinois. And then our moderator today asking a few questions is Frank Filippini, and Frank is a scientist here in Vernon Hills at our Innovation Center. Frank, why don't you take it away? Sure, thank you, Bruce. Uh, first question today is, uh, what real tangible benefits can oil processors expect when working with oil dry bleaching clay products? It's a great question, Frank. Um, you know, we have a very, our company offers a very high level of technical support both in field and at, the, at our lab here in Vernon Hills. Um, we have a full line of acid treated bleaching clay products and, our, and we have a very unique natural bleaching clay uh, that works real well in a, a several different oils. And then we also uh, offer excellent delivery service. So our on-time delivery is outstanding. Uh, we have enough capacity at our plant to meet our customers' needs and uh, keeping plants up and running is very critical. Uh, when we take a look at working with these plants, what we do is we go in and work with the operators and we try to optimize both uh, maybe the temperature, the residence time, and then we're also taking a look at the moisture and the oil flow to make sure that's good. And all that is to try to reduce the use of bleaching clay when we're working with these customers. Our acid clay products, they, they manage a various uh, oils like canola, soy, or sunflower. And uh, we also, our natural clay PureFlow B80 is very unique. And it's uh, the only organic certified bleaching clay in North America today. It also is, does an excellent job of reducing 3-MCPD esters uh, in deodorized palm oil. And uh, it's, a, it's sold around the world for that application. Um, our company has over 40 years of proven reserves and 100 years of known clay reserves. So we're going to be a partner with our companies that we work with for many years in the future. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, you mentioned technical support at the laboratory in Vernon Hills. Uh, my question for you, Dave, is uh, what types of support and services uh, does the uh, laboratory provide? Thanks for asking this question, Frank. The overall focus of our innovation center technical service team is to provide product support, to promote customer satisfaction, and to assist in new product development. The analytical capabilities of our lab affords us the ability 
to fully characterize uh, minerals that come in uh, and oil-based media. Additionally, the Innovation Center is operationally capable to process a given oil through a common set of refining stages to a sub-macro scale, 5,000 grams. We have the ability to perform side-by-side -side lab service uh, uh, to evaluate performance impact through degumming, bleaching, and deodorization stages. Our technical service requests include anything from a standard ICP evaluation of trace elements or an MCPD assay of a given processed oil to running product performance checks for our customers. Provided we receive enough sample, uh, we can assay and process any given oil in short order and provide a report within a two-week turnaround time. Awesome. As a quick follow-up, uh, how do these services translate to, to value to the end user? Our technical team is always available to provide exceptional product support to our customers at no cost as they implement our products into their processes. We help mitigate challenges by anticipating our customer needs and collaborating with them to minimize costs and maximize success. The value placed on our services alone is realized directly by current costs of doing outside lab work. Lab essays, especially ones that employ high-end instruments such as GCs or ICPs, you know, they, uh, they can be priced in the range of $300 to $500 per sample per assay. A simple performance check of trace elements, a common technical service request measuring calcium, magnesium, iron, and phosphorus by ICP, usually on three samples, including before and after and a starting control, would easily represent a $1,000 value. The value of the technical work we do on behalf of our customers is also realized in the quality and speed in which we can provide information to the customer, specifically to help align product performance with changes in oil quality, or to track down sources of downstream issues, or to provide field test support. Thank you, Dave. Bruce, over the years you've gained a lot of experience out in the field visiting many refineries. When designing or updating a refinery, what equipment or design elements can help reduce operating costs and bleaching clay use? That's a great question. You know, Frank, I've been in the industry since the early 90s and I've been in a lot of refineries. And one of the things I find is that uh, companies that have load cells on their feeders or their day bins uh, have a good chance of measuring the clay well and using less clay in their operation. Anytime you can give control to the operators, they generally will use less clay and it'll be a more efficient operation. We've also seen things like an automatic chlorophyll or colorimeter in line. This again gives the operator a lot of control in terms of how uh, to use their refinery and to make sure that the quality of the oil going out in the yard is in, is in good shape. Um, silo level monitoring devices are also uh, something I really recommend for companies, especially ones that have small silos. Uh, if you get a quality of oil come in that's uh, poor, you can really increase your clay usage and you can get caught short of ordering clay on time. So uh, clay monitoring devices are great and you can also extend that information to your supplier and they can be a second pair of eyes to keep your, your silo full. Uh, cavitation pumps are new to the market and that has been very helpful to help increase, increase yields and lower uh, chemical use in an operation. And then uh, enzyme degumming is another uh, item that we've seen in the, in the industry and that's helped increase yields as well in oil. Um, from a spent clay standpoint, a lot of companies don't have a, a system for cooling or quenching the clay and um, that's something they should really look into, especially if they're working with unsaturated oils. Thank you. One final question uh, is, uh, what needs do you see for vegetable oil processors in the next 10 years and what does oil dry have planned for the future? Great question. You know, adopting new technologies, I think, is something that, that has to continue, especially at some of these older refineries. So they need to put in cavitation pumps or enzymatic gumming. They need to put new processes in to increase yields and drive profitability at their plants. Um, other things is they need to keep exploring applications for their end products. Uh, we've seen a lot of really unique applications where they soybean oil is used in Greece today. 
or it's used to make foam products. Uh, so all these higher value opportunities will make their, their refinery more cost effective to run. Uh, focus on producing low contaminant oils. Um, I know that uh, you know things like 3MCPD esters and GEs have been a big issue over the years, uh, but now there's MOSH and MOA, so they're worried about mineral oil getting into the final product. So continuing to focus on that area to make good quality products will be important in the next 10 years. And then managing transportation needs making sure their products get to the end user on time. You know, from oil dry side, you know, we've seen this renewable diesel business kind of coming at us. And we've done a lot of lab, great lab work uh, here at the Innovation Center. And we've come out with a new product called Metal X. And Metal X is fantastic at removing uh, trace phosphatides and as well as uh, metals from various feedstocks for this industry. So it's a great product that offers great filtration characteristics and it reduces any downstream filter fouling as well because it, it, it traps well on the filter screens. We're also looking into possibly a new product to help remove chlorophyll a little bit more efficiently and, um, and we're doing some work on 3MCPD esters with one of our products to see if we can improve its ability to absorb some of the contaminants that form the 3MCPD ester in deodorized oil. Uh, but uh, we're excited about the future, Frank, and uh, I really appreciate the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, Bruce and Dave will be here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Hello, uh, we're back here. Uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed the discussion. We are open for questions. Um, I have a question, the first question for Dave Brooks. Um, Dave, what is your lab approach for understanding the percent of bleaching clay to be used in a lab setting when analyzing a customer or prospective customers once refined oil that may come into the lab? Well, it's, it's just kind of a, an interesting experience when we get these unique oils that come into our lab. The first question that we have to ask is uh, what sort of specs we are dealing with. You know, some, some oils such as alga oils that we worked with have had an overload of chlorophyll and, and we need to, to knock that chlorophyll down. There's been used oils of all sorts and types. And uh, what we try to do is, is shoot for uh, running a, what we call a bleaching isotherm. We do a, a, a down and dirty uh, bleach uh, under controlled conditions as best we can um, and look for meeting those, those target specs. And then once we've got the dosage honed in, we start playing with the variables. And it is a, uh, it is a, a, a challenge in many cases to, uh, to try to dial in that, that that unique dosage and combinations of variables. But it's, uh, it's something that we, uh, we, we, we do on a regular uh, basis uh, for our customers that, that come into us with these uh, unique oils. Um, you know, everything from alga oil to the DDGS corn oil, um, used oils, waste oils. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting ride. Excellent. I got a follow-up question for you. Um, Dave, how does lab clay dosage relate to infield clay dosage in a plant setting? So when you're doing your lab work, um, you know, you pick a certain dosage. Uh, how does that really compare to the field? Well, the, uh, for, for researchers in the laboratory, when you talk about translation of, of what's going on in the lab to the, to the refinery, the holy grail is to get direct relationships you know most of the time when we're dealing a lab scenario we're dealing with a side-by-side -side type of research uh and not uh and not going for direct you know dosage you know uh, for dosage in in the field generally uh with a lot of the oils you'll see uh that you'll have to double a lab dosage to achieve the same level of uh, bleaching or or effectiveness that you'd see uh, in a full-fledged fledged refinery. So usually what we'll, we'll come in and we'll do our isotherm, as I mentioned, and we'll, we'll pick a dosage and we'll go up 15%, uh, 
go down 15% and kind of uh, try to figure out uh, where we're at. Or if it's an oil that we've never worked with before, uh, we'll shoot for a screening test. We'll, we'll go for broke with uh, say 5% uh, clay sorbent and assuming that, that that's probably the high water mark for any, uh, any refinery to work with at two and a half percent. So, okay, perfect. Um, next question is for me, and it says, uh, Bruce, what specific examples do you have of helping an oil processor improve their process and reduce their costs? Um, I won't get into specific uh, uh, names of companies, but we've been in several companies where uh, we take a look at their temperature at which they bleach their oil, and I'll pick two oils, uh, corn oil and palm oil. Those oils uh, sometimes are bleached at too high a temperatures in, in facilities. Um, and uh, you can generally bleach both oils down around 200 Fahrenheit and, uh, and get good results. And um, uh, so we'll go in and, and when we review that, we'll uh, talk to the processor about lowering that temperature. And in most cases they can do that. It's not a problem to lower it. Um, once they do that, they generally save some good money in energy costs because uh, everyone knows you have to heat the oil up uh, in order to uh, process it. So that's one way we've done it. Um, another way, uh, some companies, when we walk in, they're body feeding DE and with the bleaching clay uh, to get flow rates. Um, and one of the big strengths of our clay is its filtration characteristics. So we're able to uh, tell them to back off on the DE dosage or completely stop it. And they generally find they don't lose any, um, you know, they can get long, even extended cycle times with our clay, uh, which of course saves them a lot of money in DE use uh, when they're running their processes. So we've done that more than one time in the field. And those are just two ways that we've uh, saved costs for, for the end user. Um, Dave, uh, another question for you. Uh, with regard to, you know, as I've talked about our clays of filtration and the uh, ability to provide very good flow rates, um, from your side of things and looking at the, the particle size distributions of our products and that, can you talk a little bit about why our clay is so effective at letting oil pass through it, um, uh, you know, people can get extended filter cycle times with it? Well, uh, our filtration properties or characteristics come from our base minerals. And uh, you, we have a, a unique uh, a mineral base called palagorskite, which is a, a combination of montmorillonite and adipolgite uh, type minerals. Now, what does this translate to? This is, this is uh, a type of mineral where you have uh, bundles of adipolgite uh, that you kind of like straws that you have propping open cornflakes uh, of montmorillonite type mineral. And this, this bridging effect and this propping effect uh, allows our clays to be very uh, uh, porous and, uh, and has, allows for the oil media or the filter media to go through it at a, at a rapid, uh, rapid rate. Um, so these, these contribute uh, to our uh, fil filter ability, as well as the fact that um, we were able to uh, adjust particle size distribution of our, of our powdered products. Um, we can go anywhere from coarse powder to fine powder and uh, achieve good flow characteristics um, because we, we control the amount of fines that are present in, in, the, in the end product uh, through you know, our, our mills and such. So. Okay, perfect. Um, one other question for me is, uh, uh, how do you educate your end users on your products uh, in the field? Um, you know, today we, we uh, when we make sales calls, of course, we analyze what types of oils they're using, uh, what kind of the specifications that they're using, and then we can make recommendation from our portfolio of products, what product to, uh, to talk to them about. But the other thing that we offer is an in, in a course 
to uh, to educate the operators. And I think um, it's very effective. It generally takes an hour to an hour and a half. And uh, the goal of the course is really just to do basics on understanding what our mineral does and, and refining. We go over refining and and what affects the uh, the bleaching clay and, and other parts of the process so that the operator has a general overview of, uh, of the clays and they know it's not just dirt that they're putting into their oil, that it has a, a cost to it, uh, that it has a functionality. And it really gives a, a good baseline for the operators. And, and most of the times I find that the operators always have very good questions for us and, and it turns into a, a give and take type of discussion. So, uh, so operator training is something that we provide in the marketplace today, and it uh, it's generally well received with our with our customers uh, in the market. Um, that's about it. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, Dave, any other comments from you? Uh, nope. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to have this time to discuss it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. With that, uh, I'd like to uh, bring on and discuss our next uh, speaker today. This is going to be uh, Dr. Van Art. Uh, she's the Director of Research at Ancom Technology, uh, where she manages research projects, uh, facilitates collaboration between engineering, software, and marketing groups, and contributes to new product development from concept through completion. Her published research outputs are focused on method development and optimization, preservation and sensitive food um, components through active biodegradable packaging and fundamentals of human perception as it relates to food flavors. Um, in her time, uh, her free time, sorry, Marlene enjoys oil painting and, and trail running. Um, Marlene's going to talk today about isolation of vitamin A, E, D, and cholesterol from food and feed using an automated method. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marlene. Um, you're up. Uh, thank Thank you very much, Bruce, uh, much appreciated. Um, so my presentation today will be a little bit more information about an automated method for extracting um, vitamin A, E, D, and cholesterol from one single assay um, through, the through a um, automation of a classic method. So a little bit more detail about this. Um, as you know, the classic method for this um, analysis is solution delivery into typically um, saponification vessels. And so these can be um, Erlenmeyer beakers or they can be um, uh, reflux condensed containers. All this will be automated in the top portion of this automated instrument. And it's controlled by nitrogen purging, um, automated mixing, and in a light protected environment. Um, next up is a complicated, time-consuming glassware intensive um, extraction method. This is replaced in the automated SPE method by SPE columns. 
Um, through this, we sidestep the problems that you have with emulsions and all the washing of glassware, as this is a disposable component of the method. Uh, next up is uh, solvent evaporation, very similar to uh, Rotovap. Instead, it's not vacuum, it's uh, positive pressure of nitrogen flow. Now this method, this um, automated SPE method will replace three steps of the classic methods, as I've mentioned, the digestion, the extraction, and the evaporation of solvent. And generally, because this is a complete extraction and it's in a continuous nitrogen environment, we don't have to lean as heavily on internal standards. It's a full extraction. And also this instrument will use much less sample and still we get the accuracy and precision or surpass when compared to the classical methods. So as you can see there on the screen, on the balance is a, an example of a digestion vessel. The digestion vessel can be put directly onto the balance. The sample can be weighed into the vessel and it then is placed in the instrument. The port that you see on the side of the vessel with a red cap can then be used to insert internal standards or any other small additions needed for this method. Next, it will digest in a, according to a programmed method. Um, the base method is 75 degrees C for 45 minutes under nitrogen environment, um, pressure release and um, continual mixing. After that stage, the liquid will, the saponification solution will filter through the bottom of the digestion vessel, which has a port, uh, onto the SPE column. The SPE column then is a silica-based sorbent that will hold up the aqueous component of the saponification solution. Uh, the instrument will then automatically fill into the digestion vessel the solvent from reservoirs that sits to the right, bottom right of the, of the instrument. Um, we will um, extract by a few small additions and then larger hexane additions to wash the analyte with the solvent into the round bottom flasks at the bottom of the instrument. So here in the recovery oven area, we evaporate the solvent while all the aqueous components of the sponification solution is held up on the SPE columns. Uh, as you can imagine, we tested this instrument for all kinds of foods and feeds and have found um, no issues in the process with filtration, with mixing, with recovery and precision, even at smaller sample sizes than you typically could use in classic methods. So we, according to the AOAC food triangle, we can analyze high fat, high protein, high carb content without any problems. Just a little more details about accuracy and precision. As I've mentioned before, um, the instrument can utilize smaller sample sizes and still maintain precision and accuracy compared to the classic liquid-liquid method. Um, this slide shows a comparison of vitamin A and E of the um, actual recoveries when compared to the classic liquid-liquid method. Uh, based on some of our collaborators' data of uh, lab control samples and certified reference materials. Then we can look at the precision where we can see similar or improved precision even with smaller sample sizes. Same goes for cholesterol and vitamin D. Um, we can see that um, recovery is comparable, if not improved, on our method. And then we can also see that precision is improved for vitamin D and cholesterol compared to a classic liquid-liquid extraction method. So another measure of um, that method validation is looking at matrix spikes. And um, the matrix spikes for vitamin A in infant formula was between 98 and 104%. Um, and then if we look at vitamin E in infant formula, it was between 90 and 110% which is, um, uh, uh, which is a, a decent um, recovery and accuracy. When we look at another lab control sample, a typical serial sample, we see recoveries from 90 to 100% for vitamin A and then recoveries for vitamin E from 96 to 108%. And this is also, um, a very good recovery, especially when these matrices are spiked at levels of 
um, incurred residue times one, times two, times five, and even times 10 for um, infant formula. With this automated method, automated SPE method, we can see when we look at a GC chromatogram, we can see the top chromatogram compared to the bottom chromatogram of the same sample, a half a gram of infant formula that was extracted either the top chromatogram by the automated SPE method or the lower one with a classic liquid-liquid extraction. We can see how much cleaner the extract is when um, run on the automated SPE method compared to liquid-liquid. Then for vitamin D analysis, most often um, customers will use mass spec for detection and that would be a very uh, low limit of quantitation and easily detectable. But even customers who run HPLC with UV detection can clearly see the peaks on a one, almost 1 1.3 gram infant formula sample at seven micrograms per 100 grams for the, the difference between the vitamin D2 in san, internal standard peak compared to the inherent vitamin D3 recovery. Um, so this, sam this instrument allows, because it is so tightly controlled, um, allows for all kinds of different research projects and targeted research. Here is just one example where we looked at comparing the AFCO proficiency testing um, data points with samples that are three to five grams of a sample, which is really a very small sample size for uh, animal feed. And still we can see how our value, how the automated method compares very well with the AFCO labs methods. Um, that was a quick run through of the instrument. Um, and this is my final slide, but I do wanna say also the software that we have on this um, automated instrument called the ANCOM Flex is modular. And so you can combine any method that needs a digestion in the upper portion, filtration, mixing, nitrogen environment with a separation phase in the middle and then an evaporation of solvent at the bottom. Um, so this instrument went to market in the beginning of this year um, and we are shortly releasing it to the market for uh, fat hydrolysis, which uses the same instrument, but uh, different temperatures and different solutions to achieve hydrolysis of fat um, from any sample so that fat can be recovered for a, a future um, fatty acid profiling, as an example. Um, uh, thanks, Bruce. That, that was the final slide. I can answer questions. Hi, Marlene. Uh, great presentation. A uh, question came in. It says, uh, <clears throat> I am interested in the possibilities of Industry 4.0. Could this analytical technology be incorporated with computer slash AL uh, in automation to control production? Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question. It's, a, it's an automated instrument. And so um, exactly what do you mean by AI? Uh, it says, could this analytical technology be incorporated with computers, AI, and automation to control production? I guess. Uh, what I can just speak to that a little bit, Bruce. I'm not exactly sure about the question, but I can give sure. some more detail. Um, what this instrument allows is it will free up technicians for a runtime is about two hours that you can saponify and analyze not analyze, can um, isolate these fat soluble vitamins in one run. And so the um, user or the lab tech will weigh the sample, put it in the instrument and walk away. After that two hours, they can come back and then use the isolate in the round bottom flasks to then shoot it on the HPLC or the GC for, for um, um, cholesterol analysis. And it does four samples at one time too, correct? It does correct? four samples at one time. That's great. Um, I had a question. It says uh, what I put down is it, it sounds like the machine offers many benefits. Uh, 
when you look at it, what drives the, the end user to purchase it? Is it the less solvent that's used or the labor costs or what, what, what do you find as the, the major interest in the industry for it? Um, it does seem to be mostly throughput uh, because mm -hmm. it's automated and it saves on tuition, uh, tuition uh, technician time. Um, it's, it's multiple things. What we have found often, uh, what we hear from industry that we didn't necessarily think about is the ergonomics of shaking a biphase and how uh, the labs are happy that the technicians do not have to continually shake biphases. So it's saving technician shoulders. It's right. um, improving throughput. It's using about a third of the solvent that you typically would for a classic liquid-liquid. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, so in, there are a few different uh, benefits, even, you know, with emulsions that you typically get with the biphase extractions, there you can certainly lose um, analyte in the separation phase, whereas the SPE technology, it's, it's not a concern at all. Okay. Um, does your company, I know you kind of answered this a little bit, but uh, does your company have plans to do more with this automated method of analysis other than vitamins and cholesterol? I know you talked about high fat hydrolysis in your presentation, but do you see other applications for it in there? Uh, we do. Um, the beginning was the vitamin analysis and cholesterol. Um, the next step would be um, acid hydrolysis. So it's a HCL in the um, digestion of a component, a small SPE column, and then the isolation of the fat. But what I did not mention is, uh, I did mention that the methods are modular in sequence. So you could, um, on the HMI screen, line up modules, you know, heat module, a drain module, a mix module, etc. So this is an excellent tool for method development, where you can actually say, I want to do an amylase treatment for something. I put the amylase through the port or through the solution delivery system. It's it's a good research tool both for method development and even for academic institutions to then see how they can develop new methods by themselves. Okay, perfect. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. Uh, it was a great presentation. It looks like a really nice machine that you guys have there. So I'm sure it'll be very successful out in the field as you uh, go out and promote it. Yep, thanks Bruce. Okay, our next speaker uh, is going to be uh, Dr. Kido Akuda. Uh, he's a, uh, a PhD for uh, technical service team lead at Am Am Amano Enzyme USA uh, with 12 years of experience in R&D. Uh, he received his PhD in bioagricultural sciences from Nag Nagoya University in 2013. His professional interests focus on how to add value to food sector by enzymes and his current projects include technical support for his customers. Uh, the description of his uh, presentation will be talking about enzymatic modification as a lot of potential as a green technology, uh, protein glutaminase uh, amano 500, PG 500 especially improves the solubility of a plant proteins by deamidating, de I'm very sorry, that's a tough word for me. Uh, the amino group of glutamine residues uh, in protein. PG500 opens a whole new array of product options in plant-based applications. Uh, so with that, uh, and his pe presentation again is improvement of plant protein functionality by protein glutaminase. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Akuto, uh, take it away. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a kind introduction, Bruce. And Amano would like to thank you for tuning in for this presentation. My presentation title is Improvement of Plant Protein Functionality by Protein Glutaminase. Uh, before I get started, let me introduce Amano enzyme briefly. Uh, first, 
We are a family-owned Japanese company with 120 years history. And we have developed a lot of unique specialty enzymes like protein glutaminase that I will talk about today. Our uniqueness derives from three distinctive synergies. Uh, let me break down. The first from application side, we are supplying enzymes to the food and medical sectors, which help us develop innovative application to both market. And second, from production side, uh, we produce enzymes by Cauchy fermentation and liquid fermentation, uh, which enable the production of a wide range of unique enzymes. Finally, the, the other synergy we have is that most of our enzymes are non-GMO, which is classical biotechnology. At the same time, we also focus on modern cutting edge biotechnology, like protein engineering and genome editing, so that we can differentiate and create a unique value proposition. Also, by taking advantage of this, we can offer tailor-made enzymes for customers. As I mentioned earlier, today's presentation is about protein glutaminase mono 500 or PG500 for short. Uh, I'd like to start with general information, then I'll cover application examples later on. Here, here are some benefits of PG, like improvement of solubility, mouthfeel, stability, and foaming. So you will see more detail later on. The first introduction, uh, PG500 comes from a non-GM microorganism. Specific name is Cristobacterium proteolyticum through a unique fermentation process. Uh, it's the only enzyme on the market that will dominate the side chain of glutamine in whole proteins and convert to glutamate. Other glutaminases on the market require monopeptide glutamines to deamidate. Then finally, PG500 is effective on a wide range of protein sources, which I'll touch later. On the right, you can see the crystal structure of PG. Uh, it was published back in 2011. The, the red colored earlier is the substrate binding site. This diagram displays what PG500 tries to accomplish. Uh, normally, glutamine has no charge in neutral condition, causing protein to not be soluble. And as I mentioned earlier, PG500 converts glutamine to glutamate without peptide cleavage. So I mean, glutamate does have a charge as a result the isoelectric point shift to slightly lower pH, and this deamidation likely opens up protein structure and increases the solubility of the protein. And moving on to the general characteristics of PG500, here you see four different charts. The upper left is about the optimum pH for incubation. As you can see, PG500 prefers acidic to semi-alkaline condition. The upper right is about pH stability. PG is pretty stable over a wide range of pHs. Then the bottom left is about the optimum temperature for incubation. PG works best between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. And finally, the bottom right is about uh, thermostability. PG is stable up to 60 Celsius and can easily be deactivated at the temperatures over 70 Celsius. Now, overall, 
the characteristics of PG seems to fit into the food industry process. Uh, this table shows the substrate specificity of PG. You can see casein, um, lactoglobulin, and collagen. Uh, these kinds of animal source protein. You can also see gluten and soy protein and then these kinds of plant protein. So I would say PG works well with a variety of protein sources. Then from this slide, I like to talk more about application examples using PG. Obviously, the plant-based trend comes with challenges such as poor solubility of the plant proteins, great mass field of the plant proteins, and function and poor functionality. The Amano would like to introduce PG500 to offer solutions such as uh, protein content improvement, mouthfeel improvement, and handling improvement. So then the first example that I want to talk about is protein solubility. Here, we tested PG500 with a variety of protein sources such as pea, chickpea, soy, rice, and almond. As you can see from this chart, almond protein solubility is improved the most with PG500 treatment. However, even pea protein, which is well known for its poor solubility, has its solubility increased by 50%. So this data indicates that more protein can be introduced as soluble state by PG treatment. Okay, moving on to the next. Uh, this flowchart shows how to produce protein isolate from flower through chemical separation. Uh, normally it is start with alkaline treatment to separate fiber and starch, followed by precipitating proteins with acid. Uh, the idea is to apply PG500 at the be beginning stage of the process so that PG500 allows more protein to be soluble. So, I mean, it shouldn't matter what ex extraction technique you use, as long as PG500 can react with the initial material. This chart shows the PG effect on three different plant protein sources. As you can see, uh, the more protein is obtained as PG does increase. Also, another thing I'd like to mention here is that PG treated protein powder has unique properties in terms of viscosity solubility and mouthfeel. As you can see, at 30% concentration, PG-treated pea protein is less viscous than untreated. And in terms of protein solubility, PG-treated pea protein is a lot more soluble than untreated, as shown in the previous slide. Finally, about mouthfeel, our sensory evaluation confirmed that PG-treated pea protein solution has smoother mouthfeel than untreated. So I'll cover more detail about mouthfeel in the next slide. We have conducted some tribological tests to analyze the mouthfeel of plant-based milks. In this test, the result showed that PG treated soy milk, which is green rye, has a lower coefficient of friction than untreated soy milk, which is gray rye, uh, meaning it will feel smoother when drunk by con consumers. Here we only show the data about soy milk, 
but we also have a similar data for other plant milks, like uh, rice milk. Another big challenge for plant-based milk is that they curdle when added to coffee or some teas. Questions arise as to why certain milks curdle and others do not. Uh, the reason is that the isolated point of the proteins within the milk, PG500 modified the isolated point of proteins to lower pHs. This change prevents the curdling from occurring when added to the acidic coffee or tea. Uh, we, and we used almond milk for this study. The isolated point of proteins in almond milk is around 5.5. And after treatment, PG treatment, it's shift to around 5.0. This change allows for almond milk to be stable in coffee. So we prepared two almond milks. One is treated with PG, the other is not, which is control. Then these two almond milks were added to coffee. As you can see from the right hand side, the control sample almost immediately cuddled after being added and swirled while the treated sample remains stable throughout the test, which is a big advantage as producers can achieve this with clean label. I mean, they don't need to add buffering salt to in, in order to maintain neutral pH, even after adding to coffee. PG PG also adds value to protein drinks by allowing producers to increase the range of flavor options they sell. With PG500, they are no longer limited to the flavors that require neutral pH, such as vanilla and chocolate. With PG500, they can introduce flavors that are better served at lower pHs, such as strawberry, cherry, and other food flavors that are desired by many consumers without the fear of sedimentation or cuddling. Here we produce two, two strawberry flavor pea protein drinks having 5% having 5% protein concentration at pH 4.5, the control sample, uh, which only have gums as stabilizer, has settled and created this unattractive layer of sediment. On the other hand, the, the treated sample remains homogeneous. We assume PG500 termination of glutamine allows protein to better contribute to stabilizing the network of interaction and work synergistically with GAN system to create the homogeneous protein beverages at a wide range of pHs. This slide is about the shelf-like study using the samples from this trial same as the previous slide, the only difference between control samples and treated samples is the addition of PG500. The samples were stored at four degrees Celsius. As you can see, the treated samples are far more stable than the controls. After two weeks and five months, the stability offered by the use of PG500 and GAMS extend visual shelf life of protein beverages more than just GAM system alone. Finally, in terms of forming, PG500 offers better forming and form stability. As you can see, soy milk treated with PG500 has 50% better formability and 50% uh, 
better form stability than the control. Then by combining these multiple benefit PG blinks, you can produce plant milks having better flow without covering in coffee. Uh, this is the last slide to conclude my presentation. It's been my pleasure introducing PG500. Uh, PG500 is a unique enzyme that deamidates glutamine in protein and having a wide range of substrate specificity. And PG500 with the opportunities it brings to protein solubility, mouthfeel, foaming, and stability. Okay, that's all my presentation. Thanks for your time. Hi, Kita. A great, great presentation. Very interesting. I mean, you just kept coming with more and more benefits to this thing as you were going along. Um, uh, one of the questions that I had for you is how, how has this been adopted to the field? I don't know how long this has been in the market. Um, do you have a, a lot of customers using it today? And, and where does your, how is your business doing with this product? Yes. I mean, yeah, it's, we are having pretty good business with a lot of customers. And uh, obviously the PG fits in the current trend, which is the plant-based trend. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it's growing. How, how stable is the enzyme? Um, you meaning when someone purchases it, uh, how long do they have before they have to use it? Or is there any issues in that area? Uh, no, in terms of stability, we guarantee the 18 months to 24 months okay. for the activity, yes. Okay, good. Uh, there's a question that came in. It says, uh, we can anticipate a wide range of possible applications for enzymes in plant protein to alter proteins to have better functionality. How do you design new enzymes to meet new customer requests? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it depends on the customers, how they can achieve in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, we have a lot of, and uh, I mean, we have a lot of strains, microbial strains, then we can screen out the, which strain can fit their customer's you know, desire. Yeah, I saw on your website, you guys have, you're probably the biggest in Japan in terms of enzyme production and applications. So I'm sure you have a lot of research and stuff that can yeah. help uh, help in those areas. Um, and then uh, I guess uh, from a cost side, uh, I mean, initially when you started, I thought there was a few benefits, but uh, as you kept going, I thought, uh, well, uh, someone's going to pay for this. So do you do you see any issue in the field from a cost side from people saying, hey, that's too expensive or or are they just saying, look, all the benefits, it's well worth it? Yeah, it's more likely more worth it. It's, it's kind of always trade-off. Mm -hmm. uh, so PG, definitely PG can add more values to the customer's product. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the customer have to think about the cost price. So it's kind of, you know, trade off. Sure, sure. All right, excellent. Uh, that's all the questions that I have, uh, Kita. It was, uh, again, a great presentation. And uh, I'm sure our audience got a lot out of that. So uh, thank you again for the presentation. Yep, thanks, Bruce. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Oren Mullins. And uh, Oren is a uh, technical sales engineer for uh, De Schmidt Balestra. Um, uh, Oren became a chemical engineer because he uh, followed his uh, older sister who was a chemical engineer and it kind of got him motivated to go after the same thing. And it was funny uh, in your little uh, write-up, Oren, how you stated that you were thinking of becoming a doctor, but you realized uh, that being a chemical engineer would you give, you, give you a better balanced life. Uh, I've seen a lot of chemical engineers and plants working uh, 12 and 20 hour shifts. So I'm not so sure about that. 
<laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Oren is going to talk today about the science behind technology. Um, uh, Deschmet, as you know, uh, gets involved from extraction to deodorization and processes, and um, they're very involved in the market and well known throughout the world in terms of uh, their expertise. Uh, with that, Oren, why don't you take it away and, and begin your presentation? Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me and giving me your time here today. I'm, as I uh, was introduced, I'm Rain Mullings. I'm with Desmet Balestra. Um, the format of my presentation might be a little bit different and a lot shorter. Um, we just want to kind of give you a brief little overview of the company and update of what we're doing. We prefer to have a format. If you have any questions, please come talk to us as uh, we're technology providers for a wide variety of different applications inside the edible oil industry. Um, so as this slide here is pointing out, we're a world leader in developing the engineering practices and technologies for some of the processing plants. And we own a lot of proprietary equipment for a few of these business areas as shown below. We have a uh, specific technologies inside of the oils and fats. Uh, we have our own press manufacturing over in England, the uh, Rose Down Pressing that uh, I'm sure a few processes are pretty familiar with. And uh, we own the line of Stoltz Animal Food and Agro Food. Uh, along with that, we have a lot of oleochemical and biodiesel applications. Um, our headquarters for that is out of um, Italy, as well as our Mazzoni soaps, um, detergents, surfactants, and chemicals. So we have a wide variety of process lines and technologies to assist uh, many different businesses and uh, anybody inside the edible oil feed field. The backbone of uh, all of our technology is based out of our R&D lab. We have a very qualified team who's helped uh, work along with some of these AOCS uh, analytical methods. Um, they're based out of Zavington, Belgium. So a lot of times we'll have customers coming to us wanting to know how certain products would work. We can work them through technological process from a lab scale, upgrading to a bench scale, and then going further on to full industry applications. So, we're, we're, we're backed up by a very strong R&D team that helps us develop a lot of these technologies and really get a, a custom tailor-made process for a lot of people as um, sometimes with the refining, everybody likes a nice little custom-made plant. They have their own special needs and desires. Uh, it also allows us to stay on the forefront of technology as uh, the rise of 3MCPDs, glycerol esters was a big concern over the past few years. and. Uh, regulations are coming, more like regulations are going to be stringent, and we've been working together with our R&D lab and as well as uh, many other processors to figure out what we can do to alleviate some of these concerns. So um, we also, uh, have, of course, have been in the business for 70 years, uh, over 70 years. Um, we have a wide variety of people working across many different countries. And we, we make a big effort to have a positive impact on the planet, reduce effluence, um, and also try and keep a good economical sourcing of steam and all utilities inside of the plant. Um, as I said before, our product line ranges from bringing the seed into the plant, preparation, moving forward into some of the extraction of the oil from the plants, refining the oil, uh, through whatever processes would be best suited for the oil seed and application to forward on to different uh, fat modification processes, hydrogenation, interest airification, fractionation. Um, so if, if you have any questions or concerns that you'd like to talk through with um, any of the DESMET team, we like to make ourselves available as resources. My information should be attached with this. 
um, as well as I'm sure uh, one of the past presidents, uh, Blake Hendricks, you all probably know how to reach him as well. But uh, that concludes my presentation for today. Thank you. Hi, Aaron. Thanks very much for the uh, description of what your company does. And, and I know you're very involved in a lot of different areas. Uh, can you uh, just briefly explain, like you're inside sales, but how does the process work if a company reaches out to you? Uh, what is your process that comes into your inside sales team and then outside? And how does your company manage that? That's a great question, Bruce. Uh, really, it, <laughs> if you're an existing customer, you've probably spoken to another salesman, but if you're not, uh, my information is there. The inquiry can come either through me or our general North American sales inbox. Um, I'll evaluate the request, likely contact you and talk through some of the details a little bit more. Um, I'll consult with, uh, I'm a little bit young, a little bit new to the scene, but I, I, so of course I'm always going to run this by my bosses who have a lot more experience. But we'll talk through processes that we think would best suit your process and uh, likely give you a call back and confirm some of those details. And as well, we, we function it as an EPC in a variety of different countries. So we really look at the whole scope of the project. Uh, it doesn't just stop at, I want to deodorize, I want this much oil. Well, why do you want that much oil? What are you going to do with it? Is there a market for this? Where are you getting this supplied from? Those sort of questions. Mm -hmm. We really, I don't want to say hold your hand, but we kind of hold your hand through the whole process if you need the assistance. So we're there for that. Mm -hmm. Good. A uh, question came in, uh, do you have any technology to mitigate MOH contamination? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not as familiar with that. Is that the contaminant it's, in uh, it's, uh It's mineral oil that's found oil. in uh, hydrocarbons that are found in vegetable oil. Um, you know, uh, there was a presentation, I don't know, a few years back by ADM, uh, a scientist in Germany for them that was really good on this. And um, they found that... Uh, they went all the way back to the plantation. And when they put the palm fruit on the trucks, it was the exhaust from the truck that was getting on the outside of the palm fruit. And then when they extracted the, uh, the oil from the palm fruit, this hydrocarbons was going into the oil. And so you had a very low level, you know, the PPM level in the oil, but uh, it was a very good presentation by ADM. And, and it was pretty interesting in terms of how they tracked it all the way back to the source because when they found it in the end product they were surprised by it and there's a lot of variation that I think you get from lab to lab when you're looking at this stuff so it's hard and in this case ADM went and bought their own equipment so they could make sure that whatever they were seeing they were really seeing the same numbers but um, uh, but anyway that I know it's a top hot topic and and I'm sure you're you know, some of your engineers in the field are, are running into it out there um, I see. today. That, um, that probably goes into, unfortunately, um, my area that I've most been working with has been refining and uh, yep. modification. We have experts, especially, so I don't know if you're familiar, Adolfo Subieta and uh, Diego Madero. Mm -hmm. um, they should be available on the booth as well. So any questions okay. for that, they'd certainly be a great resource for that. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, with regard to your, your current business, uh, where do you see the, the, the major growth uh, for you, what you what Dishmat is doing? Because you mentioned that you're in so many different areas out there in the marketplace. Hmm. Really, uh, the market seems to be a little bit uh, making a lot of movements in recent years. Um, renewable diesels, mm -hmm. pre-treatment of those, uh, it, it came into the forefront uh, as I wasn't around for it, but um, I'm told it's reminiscent of the early days of biodiesel. It's become yeah. a very hot topic. Um, so for a little while, it seems like sourcing will be a main issue. So I think people are going to want to work with what they have and get the most value and yield out of their product. Um, mm -hmm. we, we also are having some very interesting technological advancements that we're trying to pass on. Uh, a VRXDT, it's a, a little bit of different alternative to the traditional DTs that are used currently. Again, that's um, something in the extraction. So Adolfo and Diego would be better to speak to about that, but it's shown very promising results, I'll say. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And then, uh, you know, you have a lab in Belgium, and I'm familiar with uh, some of the really talented people you have over there. Have you, as Deschmet, thought of building a lab uh, in the United States or Latin America to be closer to the customer, or does it still work efficiently being out of Belgium for you guys today? At this time, we have been working mainly with our Belgian lab. There haven't been any uh, developments in the North American place. Uh, we just have such a large knowledge base out of uh, the Belgian lab. <clears throat> our office is in uh, North America. It's a relatively small office, so we really rely on a lot of that global sourcing to get things done. Sure. Um, let's see. I don't see any other questions on the uh, thing, uh, on the uh, sheet over here that I have. Um, no, I mean, uh, you know, your company's been very successful and, uh, you know, we've uh, talked to you guys quite often uh, about our business as well. Um, in terms of uh, a number of uh, employees that you have uh, globally as engineers in that, uh, how, how big are, is your real organization in terms of size? Quite large, quite large. <clears throat> as I said, out the North American office, we, we might be about 30 people in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, continuously expanding. Uh, it's been a very, very busy time. Um, we also have uh, the bulk of our engineering deliverables out of uh, Bangalore, India. We have a very strong team there that also, while, while there's a team there that works on the execution of a lot of these engineering deliverables, we also have a separate team there that works on the projects, specifically in India. Mm -hmm. um, I apologize for not having the number for you. That's but, okay. That's okay. <laughs> in the thousands, sorry, because we also have offices in uh, Belgium, Africa, Malaysia. Just uh, depending on what office you are, that's, that's very many. Located and working out of. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate uh, the presentation, Oren, and um, I think uh, we're going to be moving on to the 30 minute question and answer from the field. Um, but, uh, but thank you for, for sharing more about the Schmet and uh, Balestra and the benefits that you provide to the marketplace. Thank you, Bruce. Well, uh, the panel's here, and uh, there's really not many other questions, but I'd like to give everyone a chance for some closing comments. First, I'd like to, to thank Dr. Art uh, Marlene and Dr. Akuda Akita, and then uh, Arain uh, Mullings and David Brooks for uh, sharing a lot of their knowledge here today and, and information on their companies. It was very interesting. So with that, uh, I'll start it off. Uh, Marlene, why don't you uh, just give a couple seconds or minutes or whatever you want uh, with regard to a closing uh, about your company and, and, and the future for your company. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Um, well, it's Friday afternoon and everybody's probably heading out to their weekend, so I'll keep it short as well. <laughs> but um, ANCOP, ANCOM Technology in upstate New York has many instruments that serve uh, many industries across the world. And we are continually developing new instruments. So if anybody out there has a desire for an automated analytical method, we are the people to reach out to. So don't hesitate to, to contact us. Excellent. Um, Keda, uh, why don't you uh, give a short ending for Amano Enzymes and um, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for having me today. And obviously it's time to drink now. And if, if, if you're interested in our application, we have, we only, you know, today I only present PG500, but we also have other enzymes like proteases, amylases, lipase, all kind of uh, enzymes. So if you're interested, 
just to reach out to me or just visit our website, then just inquire us. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. And then, uh, Oren, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us some ending words for Dishmet Balestra. Yes, thank you all very much for your time as well as for having us here. Um, as I said, Desmet Balestra, we're really the science behind technology. We have a wide variety of process lines and technology to assist uh, many people who are processing. Um, so we really work best. If you want to give us a call, talk through some things, we'll be glad to help you with it. So please visit our booth, uh, reach out to any of us who you have any questions for, and we'll be glad to help you. Great. Uh, David Brooks uh, from Oil Dry, um, any parting uh, words? Uh, no, I just thank the opportunity, thank uh, AOCS for the opportunity to uh, to share what we can do for uh, for the industry, similar to uh, to Desmet. Um, you know, we have our product lines uh, geared for uh, absorption of various uh, contaminants across a wide variety of uh, media um, and we have a, uh, a good team at our uh, innovation center uh, that is ready to uh, to take on some of these these new uh, challenges that are before us especially in the uh, renewable diesel as well as uh, some of the, uh, the the unique oils that we've seen you know coming through our labs so Great, and uh, I'll be the last to speak. And I wanna thank uh, again, the AOCS also for giving me the opportunity to chair this session. Uh, I always learn things. Uh, I, I was on people's websites earlier today, looking up uh, uh, ANCOM and amino uh, enzymes and trying to learn a little bit. So it was, a, it was good for me to do that. Uh, but, uh, but I, again, Oil Dry is very focused on the future and we're excited about where our company's going. And as Dave said, the renewable diesel obviously is an exciting new market for us. Um, our technical support has been superior over these years and we continue to uh, promote that uh, in the marketplace and use and leverage people like Dave Brooks and a lot of the salespeople and Roberto Berbasi in Latin America and other uh, talented people, Barry Gursky in North America. Uh, to help and promote uh, our products out in the marketplace. So I want to thank everyone again for uh, uh, taking the time to listen. And um, I hope you guys have a great weekend and uh, have a drink, but not too many uh, and don't drive. Uh, but thank you.